10 years ago, my wife and I got on the internet in Northport, Alabama, and we bought a house in Sabi Park, South Africa, in a nature preserve. The last 10 summers we've spent in South Africa living in the bush. We've had a ton of experiences and a number of lessons in these, in these 10 years. And I'm here today to share with you one of the most important lessons that we've had and that we've learned. And I want to teach you how to sit with a herd of elephants. <laughs> what I want to do first is let me set the context. And then once we have the context, I'll start teaching you how to sit with elephants. The, this is our house. Uh, the, this, the house has, we use solar power. We can go two days without electricity. After that, we have to, or without sunlight. After that, we have to shut down. We have no cell phones, no internet. We're on our own, pretty much. We do have a panic button, and we're told that help would come within about 10 minutes. The, about 10, 10 meters from where my wife is sitting, this way is, is a, a wire fence that separates us from Kruger National Park, which is the largest national park in Africa. This is our garage. Occasionally, uh, South Africans call them zebras. We have to go in to remove, ask the zebra to move so that we can park the car. Here's the top of our driveway. Uh, we have acacia trees in the driveway, and giraffes like to le eat acacia leaves. So they, come, they frequently come in, and we have to remove that, uh, wait for them to finish their, their diet before we come in. Here's the middle of our driveway. This doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, we stop walking up and down the driveway. <laughs> uh, the, uh, for a few days, then we drive, and we're very careful. Uh, he's a very old leopard, and, and they, they jump the fence to come in. This is actually a Nick Saban recruit. And <laughs> this is actually the back, this is the back fence where, we, uh, where, I, where I said that my wife lives, or, or, or the, the tent, the, three meters from my, 10 meters from where my wife was sitting. This is an area called a lapa. Uh, we cook out here in the night, and we cook over an open fire on that area, and we, we light those blue lanterns uh, heavily with light. One of the dictums of Africa is to always be, stay close to your fire, to surround yourself with fire, because the animals won't cross fire. So for safety, we have to stay very close to the fire. That's an interesting dictum that provides an interesting metaphor for many parts of life. The notion of staying close to your fire, you know, 82% of businesses when they buy, when they make purchases of other businesses outside their field, lose money. It's always tempting to say things away from my fire look easier. Sometimes we want to stay close to our fire. This is the Protea Hotel at Kruger Gate. The the, because we don't have internet, I go here to pick up internet connections. I go there daily to see, because if, if people need to reach us, they can't. And I've negotiated a deal. There's a little room back there, a television room that they let me use to get connected. And this becomes an important part of the story, because in the television room are safari guides who they take their breaks between tours and they hang around there. And so I've gotten to know these safari guides. After a few years living and spending our summers in Africa, I had a desire to do something that I expressed to these safari guides. I told them I wanted to learn how to approach a wild elephant. And they took me under their wing, and they taught me, and I want to teach you how to approach a wild African elephant. The first thing you have to do, and the guides are, think this is really funny, is you have to find an elephant. And they all laugh, <laughs> you know, and so that's all right. Now, Next, and this is in our backyard, by the way, the, uh, you, you, have to, you have to assume an air of humility. You cannot stare at the elephant. Uh, uh, staring is an act of aggression, and only predators stare. So you have to put your head down, and then you proceed to walk very slowly toward the elephant. At some point, as you move toward that elephant, the elephant will put out its ears. And that's saying, that's an acknowledgement that I see you, you know, you're coming into my zone. And now you have to glance up very carefully. The elephants have a gland between their eyes and their ears. 
and that's, which will secrete fluid if the elephant is in heat or is in stress. And so you have to carefully glance up and see if there's fluid coming out. If there is, get out of there, okay? Because that's a very dangerous situation and the elephant's gonna hurt you. If you don't see the fluid, you can then proceed to continue walking toward the elephant slowly with your head down. But at some point, the elephant will tell you that you've crossed into the next zone. The signals of moving into this next zone is the elephant will pick up its trunk and trumpet. It will then do what is called a mock charge. It will come straight at you with the trunk raised and making noise. The guides tell me, just stand there and the elephant will stop. Sure. <laughs> Four years, okay? Four years I did this. Four years that elephant would start charging and I would run like a little child. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it is. Those things weigh three tons. They're magnificent animals. But, it's, but you can't help but ask yourself, what if, this what if A, I missed the fluid, or B, this elephant doesn't know the rules? <laughs> the guides didn't make fun of me when I told them about this, though. The guide said, it's okay, it's okay. You haven't really assumed the air of humility. You haven't really become humble. And they said, keep trying and it's okay to run away. You'll know when you can stay. And three years ago, I was out in our backyard by myself. I encountered an elephant and we went through the ritual I just described. She charged and I had no desire whatsoever to move. I just stayed. And about when she got about 10 feet away, she stopped and I kind of peeked up and she kind of looked at me like this and tilted her head. And we stayed together for about a minute. And then she looked and she just walked off into the bush. It was the most, one of the most exhilarating experiences of my life. The only thing I can think, I've always wanted to land a jet plane on an aircraft carrier. And I, and I felt just like I had done that. I felt just like I had done that. I thought it was over. The next day, uh, my wife and I were sitting on that back stoop and the elephant came back. And, it was, and, and she came right back to the fence and she fell asleep. And my wife said, are you gonna go down there? And I went, ooh, yeah, I don't know. And I, and I wanted to, but I was afraid. And so I didn't. And when I later told the guides about this experience, they said she was exhibiting that she trusted you and you should have gone and sat beside her. Easy for the guides to say, okay? <laughs> And, and so we then shortly thereafter came, flew home to Tuscaloosa and, and I thought that it, I'd had one experience but had missed the other. And I thought it was all over, that portion of the experience. We went back the next year and amazingly, within the first week of being back, an entire herd of elephants showed up. 22 elephants came to our fence and six of them fell asleep. And I wasn't gonna miss the experience this time. And the difference between going to a herd, sitting or approaching an individual elephant, an entire herd, is that the herd doesn't do the mock charge. I couldn't imagine what that would be like. <laughs> uh, and what I started doing is I learned to, as I approached the elephant, again, always without making eye contact, as I approached the elephant, I continued to lower myself until I got about three meters away. And then I would just drop to my butt. And then I could butt scoot to within about two or one or two meters of the herd. The herd seemed unperturbed by my presence. I actually did this 10 times in the summer of 2015, and it was absolutely an amazing experience. I've, I've, uh, my wife took pictures the last time I did it. People were hearing about my doing this, and they, wanted, they came and they asked to take pictures, and I said, no, it was a private experience. And the last day, my wife, unbeknown to me, took some pictures. And, and here you can see, uh, again, the head is always down, and I, and I choose not to, not to stare, not to stare at anything. The other thing that happened, and now I'm going over the edge here of being rational, okay? The elephants started parading their young past me. And I would try and communicate with them with my thoughts, and my thoughts were always, you just have an absolutely beautiful family. And they, I don't know where they learned to speak English, but, they, but, but they, I am absolutely convinced that they were willing to show me their family because I was in love with them. 
The other thing that happened, and the guides told me this wouldn't happen. They denied that this could happen. They accused me of being dishonest. The elephants began lying down beside me. And so I would lie down with them. I would lie down with them. I sleep with elephants. We're a modern family. <laughs> and, and, and it was, it was absolutely, it's been absolutely just an amazing experience. And, and the real question comes up, what have we learned from the elephants? What have I learned from this? And I think that if you ask me that lesson in one word, it's that importance of humility. The importance of humility. Uh, people have asked me how to define humility, and these are the, some of the definitions I've come up with, that, that, that we're not the center of the world. That we're not the center of the world. And, and I think I can get to the elephants because eventually they, they taught me this kind of humble act to be in their presence, and they're willing to admit me into their presence if I do this. The humility has actually changed the way I see life. This concept of seeing life through a humble lens has, has really significantly changed the way I approach various things. The first thing is I don't think you can listen unless you're humble. Arrogant people don't listen because they already know the answer. Elephants have an amazing communication system. They communicate in decibels that we can't hear. They also communicate by making noise through their, through their mouths. They communicate through their stomachs and they communicate through their feet. There's actually a theory that every elephant may know where every other elephant is in Africa because of the way it feels the ground. They also teach you how to learn. They teach you how to learn. I, one of the things that I've come to be convinced, I think it's wrong to look at animals and say how they're like us. I think what we need to do, I think that's arrogant. What we need to do instead is we need to learn to look at animals and say, what can they teach us? The elephants have an amazing thing that happens during the adolescence of many of the males. The males are often removed from the herd because they cause too many problems. And these elephants will wander around for one or two years, uh, in, uh, often by themselves or in small groups, until another herd adopts them. And that second herd will bring the elephant in, and, but before it brings it in, it will teach it appropriate behavior. The elephant has to learn to behave appropriate to become a, become a member of that herd. And you, you walk around our cities and you can see adolescents looking for a herd to be a member of. And it shows why things like the YMCA and boys clubs and girls clubs and all of these organizations may be so important to us because in a strange way, maybe they're fulfilling that same function that second herd does. The third thing is I think they actually teach you love. All of my classes now, I start out by talking about elephants. Last May, I was in Singapore teaching a class that was mostly made up of Indonesians and was 70% Muslim. And I was on the third, the final day of the class, and there was a, a man, these were business men and business women, in the back of the room who hadn't said anything for two days. At the beginning of the third day, he raised his hand and said, can I say something? And I said, sure. And he said, the first thing you do is you come in and you tell me you're from the United States. He said, no offense, I don't like the United States. He said, the United States, the consultants come over here and the first thing they do is they tell us how we should do something. They never ask why we're doing something in a certain way. He said, the next thing you do is you tell me I need to be humble. He said, no offense again, but I just don't associate the United States with humility. Then he said, you finally tell me I have to learn to sit with a herd of elephants. And I looked at him and I interrupted him and I said, you're right, I, have, I am from there and I've said those things, but what's your point? And he looked at me and he said, I love you. And I turned to him and said, I love you too. And we had this spontaneous applause from the class. It was just absolutely amazing. You know, all of the great religions in the world advocate that to be a follower of that religion, you have to be humble. One of those religions, Christianity, contends that the meek shall inherit the earth. I have this strange idea that maybe that's the message the elephants are really trying to teach us. Thank you. <laughs>